My name is Richard Bowley, and I'm the director of the Office of E-Diplomacy. E-Diplomacy is under the CIO at the, here at the State Department, and we have a, a broad mandate to improve knowledge management and collaboration within the, the State Department. Uh, we like to say uh, our goal is to move the State Department from a Cold War need-to-know stance to a post-9-11 need-to-share uh, approach. And we've done it with an awesome team doing, building some really great uh, applications like Diplopedia, Communities at State, uh, an ideation tool to help uh, define ideas and get them uh, implemented called the Secretary's Sounding Board. Uh, we are in beta now for our own uh, kind of LinkedIn social networking behind the firewall, professional networking behind the firewall called Corridor. And then we do things like this, Tech at State, uh, and also are working at, with the uh, Secretary's um, Office of Innovation, Alec Ross's shop on uh, things like Civil Society 2.0, tech camps. So we're really, uh, the, while we are the great team that we have includes diplomats, civil servants, and, um, you know, technical specialists that, we, that we've hired, it really is a very kind of uh, horizontal, uh, collaborative team. And we actually, we, tr we try to live what we preach. So that's, that's what we're about. And we're really happy that you come and, and spend the day or part of the day with us. And we have a, an awesome uh, panel here today, too, which, the, the, you know, I think the crux for, for us often is is this this culture, uh, open source, and that's the title, open source versus government culture, creating change. And government, let's be honest, oftentimes is very risk averse. Uh, you know, either it's by design uh, or because people feel like there's somebody looking over their shoulder. And so the the kind of risk or the, the tolerance for risk or failure sometimes is, is much lower. But what I often like to look at when I look at our team is that we're able to innovate within the constraints that we're faced with. So if you're a startup company, your constraints are money or time to get through the window before your competitor, or you want one awesome coder that you don't have. Uh, if you're in a big company, your constraints can be that you don't innovate quickly, uh, that you have to, uh, you know, takes you more time, you're, you're a bureaucracy, uh, it's more expensive. Uh, you know, other innovators embrace different kinds of constraints. So there's actually a product called Embrace, which is an incubator for newborn children in the developing world. And the constraint that they embrace is that it had to be less than ten dollars, you know, per per product. So they embraced extreme affordability as a constraint. Well, as we as government employees, you know, we face some constraints that probably, you know, most innovators or entrepreneurs wouldn't want to willingly embrace. But I argue that, that our team can go head to head in innovating with any group facing those same constraints or any other innovators who would be put in our same position. So I think the trick is understanding how do you work within that. And, and, and that's, I, I think, is, is kind of sets a tone for how do we look at, especially this approach to open source, which for some people still is seen as, um, you know, the more risky choice. Uh, you know, in the old days, they used to say nobody got fired buying IBM. It, 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 is, it is kind of seen as the turnkey solution that you can't get in trouble for going with a, you know, enterprise vendor. So we have, we're lucky today to have uh, a great lineup of folks who can, can add a lot to this. And I'll start uh, from the far end and talk, uh, introduce uh, Matthew Burton, who kind of made his, his name working in, in, uh, in Open intelligence uh, research. I mean, that was maybe we your first uh, your first open source analysis of, of competing hypotheses. Um, but now is doing some work uh, under the umbrella of Treasury in a new institution, uh, and we'll hear a lot more about how how that can play out. Uh, then, uh, well, we shall. Should I? You want to be introduced first, and then talk, or talk and then introduce? Okay, why don't we do that? Um, uh, and then. Uh, next to Matthew is uh, Emma Antunes, who is uh, one of uh, really when we when I first came to e diplomacy, one of the things we were wrestling with was how do we kind of have that uh, model of of this professional network, which you know now a year later we're actually launching. And the first place we went was to to NASA to see what they had done uh, with Facebook, and we actually even kind of noodled around using you know. Um, State book as a as a title to you know giving a double hat tip, um, but Emma is also you know is is a, a fortunate and well deserved um, 
award winner of the Federal 100, which just came out yesterday, this iteration, and we're lucky to have her with us. Gwen Austin, who is from GSA and is the Director of Mobile Office of Citizen Services and Innovation Technologies, and also likes to golf with her 16-year-old son. And then finally, Lisa Wolfish, who is the Chief Website Services at the U.S. Census Bureau, which is, again, another risk-averse culture, somewhat like the State Department, and Lisa is on detail to GSA. So really, what I'd like to do is maybe in reverse order, we can go back and kind of give an anecdote about, first of all, how your organizations have tackled the issue of open source and how maybe you've turned not just in places like NASA where you have a geek culture, but in more risk-averse places like Census where people – well, actually, the first – IBM came out of the Census. The first Census machine became IBM. That's a little – anyway. Well, we like to not say that we're risk-averse. We like to say that we're cautious at the Census Bureau. And we actually have a, you know, in modern times terms, pretty long history of using open source. And by that, I mean it goes back to the 90s, as opposed to our long history of innovative technologies that goes back to the 1890 Census with the Herman Holler punch cards, which, of course, later became IBM, if I'm remembering my history. So – but we had – we started using open source fairly early on, particularly as many of your agencies and organizations, I'm sure, did in the web arena to make it easier to build tools, in our case, for data dissemination purposes, not only out of the 2000 Census, but out of all the other programs that we do, what we like to call the other nine years, which we're entering into right now. And we did it because it made business sense for what we were doing. And we did it for all the usual reasons, some of which people have talked about today. We could have shared code bases. We had fungible assets and components that easily could be swapped in and out when they didn't work, when they had to change, when we changed platforms. We had, you know, of course, very low to no startup costs for a lot of these projects. And as the GSA administrator likes to say now, we could fail fast. And we could fail, as was mentioned before, with very little – with little budgetary impact. So we used LAMP stacks, you know, fairly frequently. We still do now. Census.gov is a LAMP stack. The 2010 Census.gov is a LAMP stack, very high volume. We were able to do some very interesting things back then. And so I also would like to thank the State Department for having this conference, because the interesting thing to me is how this conversation has changed from the IT geeks, you know, just really forging ahead, doing things, and sort of getting in trouble after the fact, to that, you know, boardroom, so to say, level, where we are able to do so many interesting things. And I really think that part of that change in conversation has been because of the similarities between open source, open data, open government. You could say innovation, transparency. And these are all really about these three movements, which really follow that original open source model. So for me, that shift in conversation has been – has had a tremendous impact on how government has thought about itself and how we've been delivering our services. Okay. Thanks for having me attend. And it's really – I feel pretty impressed being in this room. So I hope that somebody gets a picture of me so I can post on my Facebook page openly. I just wanted to take – talk about two quotes I've heard in the last couple of weeks about – that – about open source. And I think this is really important as we're talking about culture. Last week, I heard someone who was an IT manager talk about a project. And what they were saying – the question they asked was, are the developers developing this 
project, this project that is using open source software, are they developing it in such a way that they're the only ones who are able to maintain it? It doesn't sound like an open source thing. It sounds like something we've heard before. But I think that we're, again, talking about the culture. That was, that was one of the things that I'd heard last week. And the other thing was that actually two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, I was at a meeting, and somebody was talking about them opening up their website to uh, using these APIs. And so they were going to actually be able to take their website and have it all opened up using APIs. And which I was really excited about. And I understand about this much about APIs. So I was like, wow. So after the meeting, I went up to the person. And I said, well, how do you have your, your website structure? Oh, well, we actually, it's, it's an HTML right now. And it's really not even structured. And they're not even using semantic markup. But they'd like to be able to uh, make it available through APIs. And when I say this is, you know, I, I say these things because a lot of times in, in, in the culture that we have right now, we're throwing around a lot of different terms. Um, and a lot of people don't understand it. And people who don't know, at least I know I don't understand it. Um, but a lot of people are, are talking about it. And I think that does a disservice culturally um, in terms of being able to talk about um, the software options that people have, which include open source software as well as other types of software. And so one of the things that I'd like to, you know, through these anecdotes, is just remind people about is that we actually are in a culture that exists. You know, it's just software. Um, and these are tools that people are using to get their jobs done. And the best tool is the one that's most important. We're not going to solve all the problems about um, vendors um, um, creating proprietary systems just because the software licensing is, on, uh, is open source. We're also not going to solve the problems of people talking shizzle about the um, about and throwing around terms that they don't understand because they're trying to um, move forward in, in, in pushing the envelope forward. So what I wanted to just you know, mention from a cultural perspective is we need to be careful about our language and we need to be careful about um, what what the promises that we're making because otherwise um, we're, just, we're just setting ourselves up to, to not have the, sex, the successes that we want. Thank you, Emma. I think it's an interesting conversation to think about, well, how is this person going to use it? Because that's, that's sort of where, or how are they going to code it? That's where we are at NASA. Using open source is kind of a no-brainer. We use whatever software fits. In fact, we have open source as elements of our mission-critical software. You know, that's, that's understood. And in fact, NASA, part of our DNA, the Space Act that created NASA said we must publish to the widest extent practicable. And that includes software. We develop a lot of our own software. So the focus we have is more on how do we publish that out? You know, we have a software release process that covers different areas. You know, it covers the patent legal side of things. It covers the commercialization, you know, and spin-offs. It covers ITAR and ear because like well, my favorite astrophysicist was doing some great computer modeling to say, hey, can we model galaxy collisions? You know, well, great. Well, galaxy collisions are large particle explosions. So that comes under ITAR regulations. And often our software developers don't think about that. Um, and it also has to go through IT security. So what I, the reason I bring these up is often we think about using open source and consuming it, but we don't think about, well, what's the next step? Okay, I downloaded it. That's great. You know, well, what happens if I modify it? How do I release it back into the community? Do I have to go through the same process? And what we found is that yeah, actually we do. And so NASA has its own uh, NASA open source agreement, the NOSA, just like you have um, New has the GPL. We can't really use the GPL. We, that sort of is a one that's harder for us to do. Berkeley's okay. Um, but because we have the NOSA, it allows us to release things as open source and have the community participate and continue to work and actually share and do the open source projects. We have some work with SourceForge and other places. Um, but I think it's that next step. Okay, great, we're consuming open source. How do we actually share it? Because these are, these are the things that we have to think about. And in my job as a web manager, sometimes I have to rein people back in who are so excited and want to share things. So we just have to share responsibly. We want to make sure, make sure that software we share has integrity. So if they're doing data and working and coming up with these really um, great assessments from the data, that the data tools that we provide are accurate and that you can make that assessment using that data tool, those kinds of things. 
So I find it really interesting how the conversation is changing. And when I look at NASA's open source agreement, what I see is it's, a, it's sort of mirroring the whole process that we're doing with the terms of service. So if you look at these social media services and the government is having to write its own terms of service in order for us to really like, deal with the indemnification clauses and, you know, specific things, it's the same with open source. You know, eventually I could see us having our terms of service, you know, for a, a who knows, a federal government open source agreement that gives us the terms we need and allows us more easily to share with our you know, respective communities. A federal open source license sounds pretty exciting. I, I need one of those right now. Um, I, I think I, I have, I, I think I'm here wearing a few different hats, so I'd, I, I'd like to go through my, my history to maybe provide you some perspective on, on how I'm looking at this. I used to be an intelligence analyst at DIA, and I left around 2005 right as the community was starting to use things like MediaWiki and WordPress and Jabber. And I never really got a chance to, to participate in those. I was like an early tester of them, but I was not involved in the, the, uh, the Intellipedia wave. Um, so since then, I've been sort of an outsider looking in at the intelligence community as, as an independent consultant. And uh, one of the things I was working on for the past few years was a, was a concept for a, an analysis tool that would help analysts share information and compare their viewpoints. Uh, for various reasons, I just decided to open source it in the end, uh, hoping that that would you know, I could ride that that wave uh, that, that Intellipedia started, um, but it hasn't really happened that way. And I think that might be because while agencies are more open to getting open source in the door, they're, they're still cautious about using it for experimentation purposes. They're, they're, they will accept open source if it is established and uh, very widely used by the rest of the world, but they're not going to bring in something that some guy wrote in his apartment and start playing with it, even in uh, a safe environment. Um, so, so there's that. And then six weeks ago, I started working for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau implementation team. Uh, the CFPB was created out of the financial reform regulation last year and I'm on the technology implementation team there. So among the things that I expect to, to be doing over the coming months, months is formulating an open source policy uh, and deciding what kind of infrastructure we have. And that's really exciting because any, any cultural impe impediments that might keep other agencies from doing cool stuff with open source software we aren't really faced with that. We're not faced with cultural impediments or technical ones. Even if, say, an agency really wants to use something, maybe all their infrastructure doesn't really allow them to. We don't have any of that right now. We're building our infrastructure from the ground up. So it's sort of a greenfield, and we can do whatever we want. And in some ways, it's sort of a test bed for the future of, of federal IT. Um, and I'm interested, Emma, you were saying that, so you can't use the GPL. I'm very curious about that because that's one thing we need to iron out uh, for ourselves. And also you said the challenge is sharing it. Well, how, how do you? Are you using things that the rest of the world uses or do you post it to your website? Both. Okay. So um, today we have, let's see here. Um, we actually have some arrangements with SourceForge, so where you like you can look up NASA products on SourceForge now. And part of our open government initiative uh, response to the memo was, here's how we're going to be working with open source and, and providing that in a way that is not just on our website, because a good chunk of it, yeah, is on our website, because that's where we started. Yeah. Um, but as for GPL, I'd have to hook you up with our, our patent <laughs> counsel. Well, what that's actually one thing is Goddard Space Flight Center has the most enlightened patent attorney I have ever met. And so one reason that we're lucky is that we have 
intellectual property lawyers who understand the Internet. And I think having an agency where you can, if you're staffing up a new agency, make sure that you have IT lawyers who understand not just, you know, your patent stuff, but they get the Internet. That helped me tremendously with Facebook. It helped me tremendously with some of these others because you could have a conversation and think through what are the implications of certain decisions. So he could look at the GPL and say, well, there's certain, these are the clauses that we have an issue with. Berkeley doesn't have these clauses. And, in fact, it's pretty close to the NOSA, so we're able to use that. And that's why it's like the terms of service. People who've been working those have a really clear understanding of the very specific things that they have to address. So I can hook you up with him. Brian Gertz, I will rave about. He's the best patent attorney. I mean, counsel who understands intellectual property with software. And he said there's only a few, a few in the federal government because mostly they understand patents, trademarks, copyright. They don't necessarily understand the Internet and software at the same time. Excellent. Well, CFPB, it kind of sounds like what they always say in Silicon Valley, you know, which is how God created Earth in six days. He had no installed base. So it's, anyway. And, you know, NASA, so I'm kind of thinking of, you know, looking at GSA and also at the Census Bureau because, you know, you've got kind of two extremes. One, NASA, which is kind of a geek culture where you have people who get it and they're hired because of their expertise. And CFPB, which is a green field. But for, you know, you're sitting in the oldest federal bureaucracy now. This is the place that honestly kept weighing computers on life support when they were in Chapter 11 because we had such a large installed base that we didn't want to move off them. So, you know, people don't usually think of the State Department as being an early adopter. And yet, you know, we've been able to at least begin to use some of these social media tools, the social software behind the firewall. But there still is this kind of, I think, a challenge of convincing people that it's, you know, it's safe, you know, that the procurement process can take handle open source software, that your IT configuration control board can manage the process because patches come at different times and you've got, you know, new features and security patches kind of bundled together. So, you know, it's more the process that sometimes chokes on the decision. You know, the processes have been designed to handle COTS, you know, products. And so when you bring something that doesn't really fit, how do you address that and how do you deal with those processes to kind of, you almost have to rebuild the process to be, you know, open source versus COTS agnostic. So you have processes that kind of make it difficult. Any guidance or thoughts on that? Not really. But from my DOD days, it definitely seemed like people wanted to spend a lot of money on something. And if it didn't cost a lot of money, then why, first of all, that sounds risky. It sounds like it doesn't work, kind of. And also, we want to pay for, you know, someone to be supporting it. And also, the government has this sort of, you know, they freak out at the idea of something that's free because there are rules about, right, right. But that's unless that same service or good is available to everyone else. So, yeah, I don't know. I probably know less about procurement than maybe anyone else in the room. I know less. I think, though, that one of the things 
I'm, I, I work with the Office of Citizens Services Innovative Technologies, and so what we do is we actually work across agency lines. And so I can't, um, and I, I would not uh, mean to speak for uh, my esteemed colleagues who are actually doing the hard work and the hard lift um, in terms of keeping systems going at, at GSA. But I can talk about some of the things that that we've we've observed, and I think that um, I, th I think that uh, Matt's comments were um, his initial comments were really important in that it's not the government isn't using open source software. I would, argue, I would wager, I don't really like to bet, that most people are running um, their websites on Apache. Um, there's nothing new about that, but people are comfortable with it. Everybody is doing that. And so, um, and so there, we, we have a model that allows us to use, um, you know, a, a, a web server software and other types of software, um, and then so then so I, I guess my question is how does how does that happen? And so I think that when we create, uh, so so how do we take the models that we already have of procurement and, and understanding that it's hard to procure something that's free, um, um, and, and so, so and so what you know really what what are you buying? And I think that that's some of the, the challenges. Although I think uh, you know Lisa could talk a little bit more about kind of you know how they were able to implement. I think that's really, you know, did you buy it? Did you, did you build it? I mean, did you build a team to do it internally or? Um, you know, sure, in, in, the, in the, what I'll call the early days, um, a, a lot of it was the IT staff building systems to show that, that we could do this. One of, one of our earlier uh, systems, Census QuickFacts, was built very quickly uh, on an open source stack and the because we knew, and this is a, a different point, but because we knew that the tech implementation would go relatively quickly, we did spend our time talking with the stakeholders, determining what statistical profiles would be of most use doing the usability. And, and the, the tech implementation was, you know, really the easy part. And, and I think it is with, with some systems these days. Um, and we... We do, for some of our, uh, some parts of our OpenStack have support contracts and in place, and it's essentially treated as, as corporately supported software, and that helps think a little bit, you know, on the upper floors. Um, but um, it, it, as far as, you know, that, that procurement process, uh, we, we have a software licensing center where people put in their software requests and they mark, is this, is this commercial, is this, is this, you know, dare I say, freeware um, or, or open source? And that software is evaluated on the same level that, that any other software is. And, uh, you know, Gwen and I were talking about this because I'm also now um, on detail in the Office of Citizen Services and Innovation Technologies um, with Gwen. And um, so we were talking a little bit about this. And, you know, really it comes down to does the software do what you need it to do? Does it have the security that you need it to have? You know, the, the, that, that selection is, is really driven by those business factors. Um, you know, of course, there were some of the issues I brought up before that did let you introduce open source because of all the, 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 the other factors that, that were involved. But, you know, are you running Apache because it does what you need it to do? Well, maybe it doesn't. Maybe you need to, to run something else for some reason. There's... There, there are options out there, and um, I, we've, we've not had specific issues in the procurement or the acquisition process that would differ from uh, an open source selection versus a uh, cost selection. And I think that that's actually, you know, as you, write, as you talk about that, I think that's one of the, you know, the, the challenges is that, you know, you know, is it appropriate for government to prefer open source? Or is it appropriate for government to prefer the best solution for the problem? And I think that as we define our, our requirements um, and take a look at the options, you know, that's going to help with the, with the selection process a lot because, you know, I'm actually agnostic. Whatever, you know, I'm really having any port in a storm. Um, and I think that, that whatever's going to work the best and that's going to uh, meet my program goals and that's going to make sure I can stay within budget, the, I mean, those are the critical factors. And as we're looking at software selection, as we look at tool selection, it's important to start by what those business processes are, not, you know, kind of what, you know, what, what the software is already. When it comes to Apache, 
is it possible that it's – and I – this is an honest question. I really don't know. Is it possible that it's not the best model because – take the average non-tech-savvy government executive who might recoil at the idea of using software that anyone can contribute to. They don't know what Apache is. When they go to a website – they don't know what a web server is. When they go to a website, it just works. But when they go to MediaWiki, this is something they're using. And so they might be more inclined to ask the question, hey, what is this thing, and why are we using this? How did we procure this, et cetera? Whereas with a web server, they may not even think to ask that. And I'm just throwing this out there. I don't know. I think – I mean, that's a great point. I think we get much more – it depends on whether it's the cynic in me or who's responding. But the stuff that's deep down, and it's probably more critical because it's the backbone, nobody thinks twice about. I mean, there's a ton of open source there. But it's a small market, you know, and so it's the closer it gets to the customer, it also means the bigger the market, which probably means the bigger the value of the fight. And so the idea that the customer catches it, that people fight more over it than if it's the backbone, it's almost like you're building a building and you say, well, what the hell, I don't really care about the rebar, but the paint really matters. And so it doesn't really make sense even from a technical security perspective. But, you know, again, the cynic in me wonders if there's other reasons. So, I mean, I don't know if you want – I mean, I think it would be a good time to take some questions and also we can jump back into a dialogue. But I want to make sure, since we have a lot of people from other agencies and from state here, I'd like to open it up to questions. You're all looking – you have, like, early Friday? One was around Matt's point around prototyping for government and experimentation. We're actually working on a project in Britain at the moment, which is probably taking on the most challenging thing we possibly could right now, which is how do we aggregate personal data around a child or a family from the police, from social care, from education, into a single secure app that then enables social workers and others to have a single view of the family and the child so they can actually understand how many times agencies across the piece are coming into contact with that child, et cetera, et cetera. We've got the big issue, obviously, of data security and data protection. It's open source tech that we're building it in. But even then, there is nowhere for us to be able to host that application, which enables us to do that kind of experimentation with any real data. So we've got dummy data coming out of our ears, but we're not able to prove it in a live environment because no agency is willing to have that almost sandpit cloud environment for us to do that experimentation. So we're actually in discussions with the British government about is there an opportunity to develop that kind of cloud environment for us to play in. So that was just to say I agree. I think that's a massive issue and one that's right at the front of my mind at the moment. The other one was around the common issue that unfortunately seems to have migrated from e-government into Web 2.0, which is around the sort of the culture change piece, which is that the bridge builders in government don't really exist and they're not valued and they're not invested in. The people who would classically be known as change managers. And change manager in government tends to either be too geeky or not geeky enough. And so you normally would pay more money than you should to bring in consultants to do this role, which should actually be the integral binding of an organization and its tech function. And I just don't know how we can win the argument around these people. I mean, I'm biased because I see myself as one of those people who's got foot in both camps. But it seems to me that a lot of the conversation you just had, if we don't have that bridge building capacity, this conversation is going to happen again in 10 years' time when we call it Web 3.0 or whatever the hell we call it. Actually, Matt's got a proposal on Peace Corps for Programmers, which we're really excited and we've picked up on it and are trying to implement it some here in state. I mean, I'll give my little riff on it and you can go deep. 
No, no. Like, the, root, the, the way I take it is that you know technologists tend to move around anyway. I, mean, I spent some time in Silicon Valley, and you know you didn't stay for a com in a company for a career. You stayed in a couple of years and moved. And um, how do we? And increasingly, except you know, I think this, this is an aberration of this uh, recession. But I think people will be much more mobile in their careers. How do government capture those folks and let them come in for a segment so they don't have to come in at the bottom, uh, but they can come in at the right time and say they're going to be there for you know a couple of years and they're going to contribute the wealth of their knowledge and experience and then they'll move on, but that they're you know they're valued for that. So, well. Um I, I don't want to give the full spiel, and I, I want to pitch an, an idea that's sort of, you know, a bit uh, off the off the topic. But uh, basically, it's hard to it's hard for the government to keep a to to keep to, to maintain a talented tech team because government's always going to move slower than than the outside world. Especially when it comes to the web, uh, so you could hire ten brilliant programmers today. We just did hire one today, actually. But if he stayed, he if you know three years from now, he's going to be less sharp. Uh, ten years from now, he's probably <laughs> right. Yeah, and you know, the, the the skills. I call it the numbing and dumbing. <laughs> So we, it'd be great to have some platform to get talented people in who want to contribute but don't want to become bureaucrats. So they can contribute for a little while, and then they go back to you know, away from D.C. Uh, to, you know, to, to, to sharpen their skills once again and maybe come back again later. I want to add to that, too, on the bridge building thing. I think. Sometimes we uh, we don't accept how slowly government moves, and we forget that th changes are happening around us because we've become so accustomed to what we see today. The conversation has changed. If you look at the nature of the conversation, you know, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, it's shifted. So it's not like tomorrow we're suddenly going to have this brand new environment. No. It's slow, but it is happening. And I think sometimes we get discouraged because as evangelists, you know, I'm, I'm an evangelist. You know, you want it to be there. You want that vision for the future. And when it's not there, you start getting oh, discouraged. You can't be discouraged because actually people are getting excited about it, but it takes a long time to roll through it. And I think what we're also seeing is as things change and people become so much more accustomed to the Internet, the things they do on the outside, that why can't I do this internally is starting to get through. Because the expectation for what quality means, the ex expectation for what timeliness and transparency mean, they're changing. And I think that when we can take the credit for those baby steps, we can feel a lot more confident. It, it will always be baby steps. It is the government. So I think there was a question over here. Yeah. Sorry, I was just wondering if you could speak to um Something that we're seeing a little bit in, in my department in, in Canada is that. Is this microphone on? Oh. I don't know. Sorry, I don't it's know. on. Is it, is it on? Yeah. Okay. Um, just one thing I was wondering if you could speak to a little bit is what I've seen um, dealing with the, the IT group is that the solutions are looked for for the department as a whole rather than sort of specific parts of the department in terms of what software you would like to get or, or just what you would like to do um, IT-wise. And have you been able to carve out some sort of space where, well, I'll just try this over here and then see if it works out, rather than kind of fighting an internal battle to roll something out system-wise or enterprise-wise? I, actually, I hear, which is the, we can't help your needs right now because we're trying to solve it for everybody. We're never going to huh. get there. So that's, that's almost like the, how do you work out because people are concerned that if there's a pilot project, pilot is just, you know, the camel's nose under the tent. It's just a way of getting this thing in, and then I'll be stuck having to maintain it forever. There are ways to work it, but again, I think it's going to be different with every department and agency, unfortunately, of how much do you try to solve everything at once, which you can't, and how much do you sort of bridge it. Or, or also, like, how do you decentralize, like, the IT function within a department? 
See, this is where we're maybe a little bit different. Like NASA is very different than Canada. NASA is decentralized. So if I want to run something, um, I can make certain local choices that, you know, in GSA or in Census, they may not have those same choices to do it locally. So this is where there, there is a, um, a wide array of organizationally how IT functions are set up, you know, in, in the federal government. I think that the most important tool you have is if you have money. Um, and I'm, I'm saying that very honestly, you know. It's, well, no, it's, it's true. I mean, you you'll see things stood up in government that are funded. I mean, that's how you know that's how some things happen. And, and whether it's the Campbell's Mill was under, or it's somebody's pet project, or it's you know, um, um, uh, the best idea ever. Um, so if you have funding for it, you can do whatever you want to this off the charts. Um, and so I think that it, that doesn't necessarily help you if you don't have any money and you want to make some changes. But I think if you, in lieu of money, then the, the next best thing you have is you have the sugar daddy without maybe without the sugar. And so you're looking for an advocate who's going to help you on that so that if you can appeal to somebody to have this as a project, then you're going to be able to move – you're going to be able to um, – Move that forward. So I think that, you know, and that's what I was thinking too about the stuff you're having. It's all about incentives. And so part of it is, you know, uh, and, and, and it's finding those incentives um, that are going to work. Right now, in, the, in government, we're, we're, you know, it's, and it's hurting more on, on the federal level. Of the, I've been was it some uh, session earlier with um, state and local people. I mean, they've been under the gun for a long time. And nothing creates creativity like nothing. Um, and I think that as we're, we're having to do more with less, we're going to have to take a look at either. So if, we could, if you could solve a problem that somebody's having and it could potentially be done um, at, at less cost and, and solve this problem, you're going to be able to, to do it. So, and as I was saying before, the incentive is it, or the, the, the reason for being is not to have uh, you know, a certain type of software solution. It's to get your business done. And so it's tying those business cases and, and creating those incentives. And, and, and you know, there, there's opportunity there. Um, and it's just really kind of being creative about seeing where it is. I mean, we, you know, just quickly to it, I mean, we in, in need diplomacy, we, we fortunately didn't have a budget, so we ended up not going we went with these very lightweight tools uh, like, you know, MediaWiki for Diplopedia. And that grew, again, focusing on pain points. So, um, that, you know, the team did a great job of identifying folks who had a, had a challenge that, that would lend itself to a solution using uh, Diplopedia. And each of those people were successfully, you know, doing what they were doing better, more easily, um, and woven into kind of a natural process, became advocates. And we'd tell their story. And so you, you know, have, have great linear growth because, you know, you're, you're making a, meeting a real need. And, and it was always an option. So, you know, nobody has to use Diplopedia. Diplopedia has to be good because if not, people won't use it because they're not forced to. Also, Diplopedia is just awesome. Um, the, <laughs> um, we do have a question from the Twitter field from um, GovWin team, and I wanted to ask it because it kind of follows up with what Dominic mentioned earlier. Um, and what they said was, what advice would you give developers looking to team up with groups currently coding um, open source software for agencies? Don't all jump on at once. <laughs> Do good work. I mean, it, it sounds really funny, but the closer you're aligned to the mission and the work that we're trying to do, the more we want to use your stuff. Um, because there, it's not like I'm picking open source software because it's, it's coded in Perl versus PHP. I'm coding, you know, I'm picking something because it aligns with my mission, it solves a problem for me, and also I can get support for it. You know, so I want a big enough um, support community that's out there that I know it's just not one guy that if, if it breaks that I won't get it, you know, no one's going to address it. Um, and please make it accessible oh, yeah. uh, right. to, to, to the greatest extent. And uh, to, to, to the point earlier from uh, Ben Snyderman, give it a nice interface. Please, um, but I can't. I, I must say, as my other census hat on, as the 508 coordinator, it really helps federal agencies when your uh, programs meet accessibility requirements, or at the mo at, at the least, do their best to 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 achieve that. I'll echo that. Can you repeat the question? Just because I. I 
there's I, I'm, I we can interpret that in one of two ways and one is what are good practices for developing government software and the other one is how do I get started <laughs> developing some on something that the government is going to use and that's how I took it I'm, I don't know about you guys. Well, I, I want to know the answer, too, because a few weeks ago I was that person uh, developing something, an open source project, and wanting government agencies to start using it. Uh, and now that I'm on the other side, I need to know, I, ideally, that person would write to me and say, Matt, I want to, I want to do free work for you. But I don't know how I would how I how I, I would respond to that. You know? it ties to Matt. I know the problem you're faced with, and I've got a, a neat way that I think we could work together on it, because that's going to get your attention. I've got free time. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, whatever. Right. But I know your problem, and I've thought about it. And to me, that is the most interesting thing, and that's that's probably where more of NASA's open source projects are within the science community or within everywhere else. Anytime a vendor understands the problems I'm wrestling with, I don't care if it's open source or payware, that gets my attention. And that's that's really the person I want to work with, is that they've taken the time to understand my needs. Matt, make sure you talk to your procurement professionals. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'll just add one more point, which isn't necessarily how to get government agencies using their data, but you know, we love to see the really clever way, or using your, your software, we really love to see the clever ways that people are using our data and, and making our data easier to use out in the public. There, I know there are a lot of um, utilities, for example, for using Tiger Line files for geographic boundaries. You know, that that is something to, you know, to, to help agencies really get their data to be used, which is, you know, what gives it its value. I think following up on that, and that's, you know, um, there's one thing to have government, you know, use um, um, the services or the, or the data, but the other thing too is that it, government is not the only source uh, or the only user of this information. And so if the idea is you have a good idea, you have a good idea. And government may not be the, the conduit for, for, for that person's solution. Uh, first in the back, and then uh, Alex. Perhaps what I'm asking for already exists, but I wonder if the federal government can um, share among ourselves how to move forward and change our environment within the agency. So perhaps the larger agencies have fought the battles, but the little agencies were fighting those battles now, and we don't have a big team. It may be me and someone else. As an example, we need to try to educate, I think is the right term, general counsel in terms of these issues. As an example, I tried to put a blog on a Google site for our agricultural specialists, and it took five months to get to general counsel, and the only information we were asking for was first name, last name, and email. But that, you know, that just basically really slogs things down. I think trying to educate IT, they have a, an, a, an idea that unless you pay a lot of money for it, it's not any good. So if the larger agencies could, if we could set up some way that you could share those best practices or strategies or rationale with the smaller agencies to help us move forward, we would greatly appreciate it. Well, I know in, 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 the, in the social media world, if you um, are at a federal agency you can, or, or a state local government agency, you can join the federal web managers list, and a lot of these issues are discussed. And I would say, you know, half the things on that list are, hey, you know, we're doing ABC. Who's done it? What are the issues? So that they can proactively have those. You know, I, I definitely, being in central IT, feel some of some of the pain that that. IT can can bring about, but um, you know it's 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 not it's not uh, arbitrary or uh, you know malicious in any way. <laughs> um, we you know we we have we have hindrances that we have to to work through also. And what what worked really well with us um, in the in the 2010 census 
in being able to establish so many things that were done on the 2010 census website and with a huge social media campaign was to bring IT into the picture as soon as you have a spark of a little thought of an idea in your head, talk to IT, get them involved on board. There's nothing IT likes worse than being surprised. I think related to that, uh, one of the things I've seen that's been, that has been growing, I don't want to say successful, but has worked sometimes, um, is you know really bringing the groups together. And so part of it is um, I'm, I'm seeing more um, you know, uh, new media or social media or IT councils or whatever that already exists with, within, within an agency that's really going to be cross-discipline. So it's going to talk to your people in IT, your top people who may be doing privacy or, or um, records management as well as development and public affairs and really getting that cross-group together ahead of time and building those relationships. Um, there's a way to maybe take advantage of those five months that you spent having building this amazing relationship with your your legal counsel, and and to, and to maybe um, have another meeting and maybe uh, in another month, and maybe bring in your security people or whoever the other people are, so that you start talking to each other earlier. Um, that's within your own agency. But I, I do want to um, um, piggyback on what Lisa was saying about the um, uh, federal managers listserv. Um, and then another resource that's coming out of our offices um, at GSA is uh, a website that we um, brought out uh, a couple weeks ago called howto.gov, which talks about different best practices. And we're really building in, in different areas in, in, in new media as well as, as some pieces of technology. There's also some, and, there'll be, and there's sample policies that other agencies have used that have been put up there that, that may be helpful as well. Um, so I do recommend that source. I agree with Lisa on getting sorry. Agree with Lisa on getting involved early. And one of the things there is the key phrase I found in working with a legal team is not can I do this, but how can I do this? And getting them to be partners with you on finding a way. So work with them. The what that you need to do is non-negotiable, but the how you do it, let's work together. Let's figure it out. Maybe it's not a Google group. Maybe it's this other thing. But my end goal is this. Help me get there. And I find that if I can have that attitude when I talk with all of my different stakeholders that I need to have on board, that I, I make a lot more progress. And I think sometimes our smaller agencies actually can get really creative because, like what Gwen said, when you have zero money, you find ways to be really creative and get your mission accomplished. Not that I'm advocating no money. Yeah. <laughs> But it makes you creative. Uh, but I, yeah, I, mean, I second all of that. We, when we were launching or early in, in developing a corridor, we got a one meet, two hour meeting with 40 people who we thought would care about what we were doing. And we went around the room and addressed each one and said, if we bake in this solution to your, to your problems, are you okay? So basically, we wanted, you know, we want to proceed. Is there anybody who would want to veto this? And you know, that was kind of our green light. Um, so uh, one of the things we're seeing is releasing open data is one thing, right? And then you're encouraging people to work with it, uh, clean it up, find issues with it. Uh, Todd Park talked about that earlier. With, with open source, it seems like some of the um, different issues of a uh, comparable culture, and this is about culture, so that seems uh, appropriate to bring up. Um, what uh, Gunnar Hellison uh, described earlier, which is that government um, has fewer barriers to using open source but as you looked around the room in this set, which we can assume has more open source users than perhaps the average government uh, collection, um, and certainly the average uh, collection of people coming to government, um, there are very few people who have actually given code back. And uh, in terms of discussing open source in the context of government, it seems like that's a very important thing, particularly with open government, which I know uh, each of you has been invested in on one level or another professionally now. Um, how does that relate to the uh, government's ability to work with developers or citizens on its own code? Can you accept contributions to it? Um, there's a conversation going on in the parallel to us right now around national security. Um, is that culture going to be able to change, or are we having a happy moment here, but the reality is that in agencies where you know, serious work gets done, they'll never accept code uh, from citizens? 
Well, I'll answer that because we are accepting code. So when we put things out under the NOSA license, the idea is that other people will participate. And in fact, they'll let us know what they're doing with it and give it back to us so that we can continue and make those changes you know, available to everyone else and make it participatory. Because I would say the thrust of our open government is on participatory exploration. It's not just, hey, this is great, we're going to tell you what we're doing. Well, actually, we, we want you to participate in what we're doing, too. Um, and actually, that gives me a chance to clarify what I said earlier about the GPL. It's not that um, we can use software under the GPL. It's just that we can't release it back under that. That's where our own licensing issue comes up that we're still working out for the terms of service for our license. I feel like there's a ringer in the room with NASA, though, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to let the other folks talk then. You all are designed to share scientific information back and forth, and that's just not true in a lot of other cases. But I think, though, when you're looking at the mission of NASA, that's their mission. Uh, and so part of it, you have to take a look at, you know, and so when you when you say something like when people are doing serious government, they, will they be able to whatever? I mean, you know, it's, it's going to depend upon the mission and what the, the, the organization is. So when you kind of, you know, posit it kind of like will it ever, will, will some people never? Yeah, some people probably never will because of their mission, because of what they're trying to do. Um, they, they may have those limitations. And so I think part of it, again, goes back to the business case and, 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 and the limits that, that people have. Um, I think, though, to Emma's earlier point, though, that there are changes that are happening, and it does go with the speed of government. Um, and we're, we're going to be continuing to work through those. But I think that there are examples of people who are using it. Um, and, and, you know, and, and going back to Matt's opening remarks, it's just like and the more people who use it in government, the more comfortable government gets to, with it, and then it becomes adopted. And, and so then it'll, it becomes more acceptable. Um, I, and, I, and I thank NASA and I thank Emma and other agencies um, and census for actually going out there and, and who are able to do that work and to talk about it and to share it with us. I, I, I'm hearing a, a, a couple of ideas that I, I'd be sort of interested in linking together. I think um, a comment that I've heard is that the, the interesting uses of technology don't really start until we stop talking about it, the technology being interesting. And I think um, to Dominic's point about change agents, part of what has happened in e-diplomacy is that it's not a singular group of like people. It's a very diverse office uh, where diverse across a variety of types and it brings together that so that I think that not individually necessarily but as a group we bring together both the, the, the tech and the, and the mission side of things. I think with respect to um, how to advance that discussion within an agency um, there's certainly a lot of work ahead, but one of the things that we've found has worked at least case by case is abstracting the problem a little bit, you know, being technology neutral and saying, okay, here are the business requirements and, and kind of the, what, what you were just saying, so that you're looking at, um, at, at what the mission is and what you'd like to accomplish, and then the technology is, is derivative or in, in service of that and that's frequently not the way the process is set up now. And so it does take, you know, kind of an intentional step uh, to do that. But I, I'm interested, though, in, I, I, and I guess one more thought, and, and again related to, uh, to Dominic's comment before, that um, a lot of the, the needs are needs that we don't know. The, the case that you described is not something that we're currently dependent on. It's not a need that people appreciate because they don't have it, they've never had it. But wouldn't it be a better world if they did? And, and I, that's some of what I hear out there and some of what was, uh, I think, a theme in the, uh, the open data uh, discussion this morning. I'd like to um, jump a little bit on that and put on my mobile hat, too, because I think that one of the things that we're seeing um, in taking a look at, you know, not the systems we have today, but the systems we're going to need in the future and the way that we're going to be communicating with people in the future is really about making information available where they are and when they are. 
And I think that as we're moving forward, um, making, you know, and, and looking at things as, as complex and simple as different apps contests. And we're looking at um, agencies that you wouldn't necessarily think would be very open. I mean, um, the Army had run apps for the Army, creating apps for um, soldiers to use in theater. Um, and it was done internally among DOD, so it wasn't open to the rest of the world, but um, that round wasn't. But it was really looking at creating um, applications that people could use based upon what the needs were, you know, in, um, you know, in the field and, and making have those business cases and then getting, to, in some cases, extraordinarily creative. And when we're looking at open, I want people to think about kind of the openness of, the, um, the, the data, because those APIs that are going to be open data are going to be feeding a lot of these mobile applications. And as government may be making these applications, you know, there's, there's an example of the recalls um, app that was created by um, with um, looking at recall data from multiple agencies, and I'm not going to name them because I always forget one. Uh, <laughs> Um, but in looking at um, information about um, uh, product recalls, and that API then was then published so that other people could use that API um, information and, and create their own applications as well. I think we're going to be seeing more um, use of, of, of data and making data available. Um, on the flip side of that, though, is that when we're looking at mobile um, um, mobile ready applications and information, we need to take a look at the openness of the systems that we're, we're delivering them on, too. And so that I know a lot of people like, you know, certain types of um, devices, um, but not everybody's using those same devices. And some of those devices are, um, people who are advocating open are not using most open systems as well. And so I think that there's, you know, we have to take a look at kind of how we're delivering information, what are the systems that we're developing right now that could create information that's going to be open for the future so we're going to be able to deliver this information device independently and time independently and in the way that people want to receive it. I agree with what you said about um, the uh, Basically, that a lot of times we're we're too uptight when it comes to this stuff. Instead of just having a problem and trying to deal with it, and then letting something interesting come out of that work, we start from trying to do something interesting uh, when the pro before the problem has even before we even have the problem, and th th I think that raises another aspect of government culture. We need to we need to sell things. We need to, every, the, the project has to be big and grand uh, in order to, you know, to get people time to, to work on it. Uh, so, yeah, you can, it's, it's just hard to, to do something tiny. Any other questions? Comments? Going once, going twice. Mm -hmm. so, thanks. I want to thank uh, our panel this it was, uh, it's, and thank all of you for, for uh, on a Friday afternoon when you could be trying to skitter out of town or uh, um, for, for being here. And uh, you know, it, it, this is the stuff that oftentimes isn't talked about, um, and yet is really can be either the, the grit or the grease in getting things done. And so. Uh, Taking time to think about it and and really share experiences is is uh, you know thanks again for taking your time and thanks for panels for sharing. <laughs>